Man. So you guys can all hear me. Um, so today my brain is in a bit of turmoil because um, you know we spent some time. Normally, you know, the time we use to practice and put together our PowerPoints and all that stuff. Uh, I didn't get here early enough to do it before the prayer time. Uh, and then um, and then we went into prayer time and uh, and then we went straight into that. We were running away from that into our Sunday school time. We were running away from that into our sermon time. Uh, I saw that, you know, like in the back, uh, I guess um, we had, you know, gotten everybody like laid out to like question marks on who was going to do what. And uh, and that, especially being from other churches in the past, that, you know, gets me like wild up and stuff. Yeah. Um, just, just because. You know, like I don't know what to do. I'm not a comfortable with being free flowing, but I will say that you know, like it makes me feel weird, but I'm unapologetic about it because we were together in prayer. We were together in prayer, and I'm not going to be sorry that maybe things didn't look as professional as they could because we were praying. I'm not going to do that. However, so I'm not going to apologize for that. I do want to apologize about something though. Last week, so we had a message we're talking about here. And then at the end, I was like, let's spend some time praying for each other and praying that we may, you know, be able to speak boldly and be able to pray about the future. Um, and then what, you know, my thought was is that we spent some time prayer, in prayer, but I didn't want to be super quiet, uh, so we played a song. Well, whenever I play that song, the lyrics were on the back, and I think that's okay, but I feel like I did a disservice to you by putting that song up there and the lyrics on that. And the reason for that is it's a bit of a distraction from what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be communicating with God. And, and I spent time in prayer, but then I started listening to the, to the lyrics and stuff. And I don't know, it took me out of a moment and I wanted us to like really be able to pray for each other. Rather than like hearing our voices lift up in the church, we were hearing the song. Anyway, I don't know, but throughout the week, I've kind of been, you know, I was like, I think I think I've missed the mark on that. Uh, because I think it's incredibly important for us to pray. And so, you know, last week uh um Andy sent out a little message about the prayer meeting, you know, last week and then this week, and I and I was thinking about that, and I do think that as a church, we should pray to Um, you know, uh we were you know talking over this and was thinking about, you know, like what is what brings us close together just as people generally well 14 years later um, <laughs> oh, i will get to my point that's what it's getting at. no um no you're fine that's good. um so it's communication right back in you know the 1700s how did we you know if you wanted to reach somebody who was far away what did you you know you wrote a letter right Especially, you know, especially in the you know, 18, you know, time, 1700s, 1800s, if you had family overseas, you would write them a letter and it could take you, you know, a month for a correspondence to go back and forth, right? Well, people probably didn't feel terribly close to each other. Now we've, you know, gone on to phones, we've gone on to, you know, having cell phones and Zoom and all of these different things, all these communication tools for us to come close together. Um, and I think that it's great that we, you know, we have all these things. However, sometimes they can be a distraction, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, like, you know, we, we need to be in this kind of constant communication with God. Um, but, you know, like, if we have too much coming at us and we're so busy, like, a lot of times we're not going to pick up the phone, right? We'll see the end, you know, the call come in and we're going to put it down. Um, and we do that to God sometimes. And so I want to talk about a little bit about prayer, especially as a congregation. And I was putting together a bunch of stuff, and, and I spent a lot of time reading messages and different things, and, and I kept coming back to a, uh, a message by Charles Spurgeon. And every time I would try to put together, you know, my own message, I just kept thinking about the words he said and how much more eloquent he put it. So, uh, rather than just give you a Joel synopsis of Spurgeon's message, message I'm going to do a, basically a dramatic reading of this sermon by Charles Spurgeon. If you feel like you know, like you want your money back for the ticket at the door, since I'm plagiarizing, you can get it. Uh, the ticket to the 
Uh, also, it's not the shortest thing, so we might not be back to two chapters, but I think it'll be okay. Uh, so he starts off because the next day in, in this message, it's on an evening, it's a Sunday evening, they're gonna have a uh, a prayer meeting the entire next day. And so he says, Well, I think we're gonna I wanted to talk about I want to talk about prayer and the purpose of prayer meeting, about getting together as a church as a congregation for prayer. And it brings up Acts 2, uh, verse 42. And it says, they, both, they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. So in their possessions of good, they gave to anyone as they needed. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to the number daily. They were being saved. So it starts off on the apostolic history of meetings for prayer. It said they were doubtless everyday things, these prayer meetings. The first meeting for prayer, which we find after our Lord's ascension to heaven, is the one mentioned in this text. And we are led from it to remark that united prayer is the comfort. Of a disconsolate church. Can you judge of the sorrow which filled the hearts of the disciples when the Lord was gone from them? They were an army without a leader, a flock without a shepherd, a family without a head. In deep desolations of their spirits, they resorted to prayer. They were like a flock of sheep huddled together in the storm and come closer each to its fellow when they hear the sound of the wolf. Poor defenseless creatures as they were, they yet loved to come together and would die together if need be. They felt that nothing made them so happy, nothing so emboldened them, nothing so strengthened them to bear the daily difficulties as to draw near to God in common supplication. Beloved, let every church learn the value of its prayer meeting there is but one remedy for these and a thousand other evils, and that one remedy is contained in this short sentence, let us pray. One of the first uses, uses of the prayer meeting then is to encourage the discouraged people. Again, if you look at the second chapter of Acts of the Apostles, you will perceive that the prayer meeting is the place for the reception of divine power. They were all with one accord in one place, making their prayer. And as they waited there, suddenly they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and the cloven tongues ascended upon them. And they were clothed with, with the power which Jesus had, uh, had promised them. Common fishermen became extraordinary messengers of heaven. Illiterate men spake the tongues that they had never themselves heard. Now, Great one of the church in all times is the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, if we get this, the most likely place in which to find it is the prayer meeting. Oh, yes, this is the place. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yes, this is the place to meet the Holy Ghost. And this is the way to get his mighty power. If we would have him, we must meet in great num greater numbers. We must pray with greater purpose. We must watch with greater earnestness and believe with firmer steadfastness. The next incident in the apostolic history you will find is Acts 4.31, which we talked about last week. And there you will see that the prayer meeting is a resource of a persecuted church. Peter and John had been shut up in prison. They resorted to prayer. When we read that but that when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word with boldness, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Anything that would make us pray would be a blessing. And if we ever should come to times of persecution again, we must fly to the shadow of the eternal, and keeping close together and simple, intense prayer, we shall find the shelter from the blast. 
In Acts 12, we find the prayer made, made a means of individual deliverance. Peter was in prison. Herod himself, uh, Herod promised himself the great pleasure of putting Peter to death. He was sleeping one night, the two soldiers came to the keepers of the door and kept the prison. But the prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And so, in the middle of the night, an angel smote Peter on the side and raised him up, and his chains fell off. He put his garments about him, every door opened as he advanced, and Peter himself in the street. Uh, and he wondered whether he was awake or whether it was a vision. Acts 13, 13, uh, in there we find a prayer reading suggesting missionary operations. While servants of God were met together in fasting and prayer, the Holy Spirit said, Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I think if we were oftener on our knees about God's work, we would oftener do right and the right methods, and the right men, and the right plan to come to us. Oh, that we would pray for such men, and having got them, pray that God would make, make them full of himself. For they cannot run over with blessings to others until they are full of blessings themselves. We should understand what, prayer, what the prayer meeting is. If, uh, we would understand what the prayer meeting is. What was the first Christian service held in Europe? Do you know why it was a prayer meeting? In Acts 16, Paul went to the place where prayer was prayer was wont to be made by the riverside, and there he met with Lydia and preached to her, and in her heart was so open that she received the truth. Very often, I do not doubt, in a Christian enterprise, the first foothold that a cause gets is the prayer meeting. This then is the missionary's letter. He begins with the prayer meeting. I've gone through the early history of prayer meetings and shown you the extreme value of such of the, of the church of God. So what are the uses of the prayer meeting? The prayer meeting is useful to us in itself and also very useful from the answer which it gets. It is a very useful thing for Christians to pray with each other even apart from the answer. God has made our piety to be a thing which shall be personal. But yet, he looks for family time and makes us feel that all the saints are our brethren and sisters and that therefore our meetings as Christian families and as Christian churches in the prayer meeting become the natural outgrowth of social godliness. The prayer sometimes also generates devotion. Some of the brethren may be very dull and heavy, but others who are at that time in a lively state of mind may stimulate and excite them. When you have been very busy all the day and are not able to shake off the cares of business, you get warmed up by getting near to each other in your prayer. And more than that, the united fires being placed together on the heart, the fire grants are made to burn with greater power. There is a kind of divine force that comes to on us sometimes at the prayer meeting. Oh, it is a grand thing thus to be made fit again, with joints all oiled, muscles all braced, nerves all strung for the battle of life, unified in prayer. Then serves this purpose, and therefore it is valuable. But again, united prayer is useful inasmuch as God has promised extraordinary and peculiar blessings in connection with says, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them uh, of my Father which is in heaven. God asks agreement. And once the saints agree, he pledges himself to the prayer of uh, sorry. He pledges himself that the prayer of his agreeing ones shall be answered. Why see what accumulated force there is in prayer? When one after another pours out his intimate desires, when many seem to be tugging at the rope, 
when many seem to be knocking on mercy's gate, then the mighty one, then with when the mighty cries of burning hearts come up to heaven. When, my beloved, you go and shake the very gates thereof with a powerful battering ram with a holy entrance and a sacred importunity, then is the kingdom of heaven, heaven suffer in violence. When first one and then another and another throws his whole soul into the prayer, the kingdom of heaven is conquered and the victory becomes great indeed. That was an interesting one for me. That actually is a scripture from Matthew 11 and 12, where uh, this is separate, just so you guys are aware of what it's talking about by, by the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. Uh, if you talk about when after John came, people were so excited. And they were so fervent for God to touch them that they were gathering around and it was like a almost like a proverbial violence. Like they couldn't keep them back, right? Which is what he's talking about. And he wants us to be there and be so excited for the things that God has for us. Um, that it's almost like we're a violent crowd trying to get at the other thing that is. Anyway, so that's what that is. <laughs> it seems weird to me. Um, the prayer meeting is an institution which ought to be very precious to us and to be cherished very much by us as a church, for we owe it everything. When our comparatively little chapel was all but empty, was it not a well-known fact that the prayer meeting was always full? That was it. Especially this morning, you know, with the, with the few people we had, you know, we have in this congregation how many of us are we're going together in prayer at the meeting? Was it not a well known fact that the prayer meeting was always full? And when the church increased and the place was scarce large enough, it was the prayer meeting that did it all. So, what are the hindrances to the prayer meeting? There are some hindrances before the people come. Unholiness hinders prayer. A man cannot walk contrary to God and then expect to have his prayers heard. Discord always spoils prayer. When believers do not agree and are picking holes in each other's coats, they do not really love one another, and their prayers cannot succeed. Hypocrisy spoils prayer. Well, hypocrites will creep in and you cannot do it. But there are some things which hinder the prayer meeting when we are at it. This is kind of funny. One is long prayers. It is, I love how I put it. It is dreadful to hear a brother pray us into a good frame and then by his long prayer pray us out. <laughs> I love that. Long prayers spoil prayer meetings for long prayers and true devotion in our public assemblies seem pretty much to be divorced from one another. What he's saying there is if we spend too much time praying, trying to show how good we are, you know, how much we know, how spiritual we are, then maybe we're not as close as we think we should be. Prayer meetings are also hindered when those who get up to pray do not pray but preach a little sermon and tell the Lord all about themselves so he knows their own better than they do. Instead of asking at once for what they want, prayer meetings are often hindered by the want of the reverence and by beating around the bush. I did admire a prayer I heard last Monday night in which the brother said, Lord, the orphanage, the orphanage wants 3,000. He plans to send them. In the prayer. Prayer meetings are also hindered by a want of real earnest in those that who pray and in those who pray in silence. I fear that much of our prayer is lost because we do not sufficiently grow our hearts in. But the prayer meeting may also be spoiled after we have been to it. How say it's why by our asking a blessing and then not expecting to receive. And that by asking a blessing and then not expecting to receive. God has promised that he will do to us according to our faith. But if our faith is nothing, 
then the answer will also be Inconsistency too in not practically carrying out your desire will also spoil the prayer meeting. If you ask God to convert souls, but you will not do anything for those souls, if you ask God to save your children, but you will not talk to them about their salvation, if you ask God to save your neighbors and you do not distribute tracts among them nor do anything else for them, are you not altogether in prayer? You pray for what you do. You pray for what you do not put out your hands to get. You pray for fruit, but you will not put out your hands to work. And all this spoils prayer. Earnest, however, earnest prayer, however, is always followed up by persevering efforts, and then the results will be great indeed. So, what should be the great object of the prayer meeting? And, and that for which we seek the answer. First, it must be for the glory of God, or else a petition is not sufficiently put up. Pray that King Jesus may have his own. Pray that the crown royal may be set upon that dear head that once was dirt with horns. Pray that the thrones of the heathen, heathen may totter from their pedestals, and that Jesus may be acknowledged King of kings and Lord of lords. And then, in subservience to that, in subservience to that, let us pray for a blessing on the church. We ought to exercise a little of our love for one another in praying for our fellow members. Praying for the minister, for he needs it most. His necessities in that direction are the greatest, and therefore let him be ever be remembered. Pray for the church officer, for the elders. Pray for the workers in all organizations. Pray for the sufferer. Prayer for the strong, prayer for the weak, prayer for the rich, prayer for the poor. Prayer for the trembling, prayer for the sick, prayer for the backsliding, prayer for the sinful. Yes, every part of the one great body of Jesus let our supplications perpetually ascend. Then we should all pray for the conversion of the ungodly. Oh, this ought to be like a burden on our heart. This ought to be prayed out of the lowest depths of our soul, that is all the world would sink in the sun. They are dying. They are dying. They are dying without God. It is of no use my preaching to the people, my dear Christian brethren. Unless you pray. It may be that you who pray have more to do with the blessing of the Lord than we who preach. He has given us this pledge that He will answer. Believe it, and you shall see it, and you shall have the joy of it, whilst His, whilst his shall be the glory. For the next few minutes, just pray, pray silently. You can pray out loud. You can pray for yourself. You can pray for your brothers and sisters. You can pray for God's glory to be done. You can pray for the people around us, the lost and hurting world. The city of Austin, which is so far from God. So just for the next few minutes, feel free to, to pray out loud or in silence. Um, and then after a few minutes, we'll have a closing song, and then we will be spread in the prayer.
Stand and sing a closing song. <laughs> 